Well, greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is still doing well. Have I got a bonus upload for you all today? Before we jump into this very interesting bonus, a couple links. As many of you all know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe, it doesn't cost a cent. Click that like button, takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon. And folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all these things really do help the channel to continue to grow and go. And yes, folks, they definitely do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in to today's bonus, shall we? Today's first encounter. Valley County, Idaho. We were camped at an old abandoned mining town and mine near Deadwood Res in October of 96. Our son had an encounter with an unidentifiable being. My husband's company was helicopter logging near an area that was once an old town and a mine in the forest. It was opening day of deer season, and our son, who was 14 at the time, got up early to go hunting near camp. We were near the Deadwood River, which was little more than a creek. He took out his rifle to see if he could get a buck that morning. He crossed the river and went up the hill to where he could get a better look at the river and the flats below. Our pilots were camped down near the river about a quarter of a mile from our camp. As our boy was looking down toward the pilot's camp, he observed what he thought was a bear down on the flats near the river. He thought that it was a little unusual that this bear was walking very steady on its hind legs, more like a human. The more he watched it, the more uncomfortable he began to feel. As he was watching it, it suddenly looked up and started staring back at him. He felt sudden fear race through him as he felt its eyes lock onto him. He told us that he's never felt that feeling before or since. He said that it was very dark in color, very tall and hairy. After it had stared at him for a time, it proceeded to walk towards where he was standing. Realizing that it was moving in his direction, he turned around and started racing back to camp as fast as he could. When he got to camp, he ran into our fifth-wheel trailer, shut the door and locked it behind him. He then closed all of the curtains and blinds. He was absolutely scared to death that that thing he saw was coming to get him. He wouldn't come out of the camper at all until I took him home two days later. He kept the door locked at all times, the curtains drawn, even in broad daylight. Another unusual thing that we noticed up there was in the basement slash boiler room of the old boarding house that was near our logging land camp. It looked like a huge nest in the corner near an old boiler. It was made of evergreen boughs and leaves. It looked like it was being slept in by a very large animal. The floor was soft dirt. It had a very strong odor all over that part of the building. It was open to the outside by an open doorway. And tonight's second encounter, Valley County, Idaho. At the age of 12, my cousin and I embarked on our first official hunting trip with our other cousin and dad. We set up camp early in the day a few miles north and east of McCall, Idaho. The day was October 25th. The weather was cold and clear, with a corona around the moon telling of a snow to come. It was dusk, and my cousin and I had just finished setting up our lean-to shelter, about 70 yards from where my dad and other cousin had their tent set up. We both got the feeling that we were being watched. 
We turned and saw a silhouette of a very large, bipedal creature observing us from only about ten feet away. Scared, we reached for our rifles, but by the time we turned back around, this creature-slash-animal was gone. My older cousin was quite the prankster, so immediately we thought it was him. But he was still at the campfire talking to my dad. In the morning, no tracks were found on the ground, but it was nearly frozen. The next day, we walked up into a nearby drainage, about seven miles from our camp. At an elevation of 7,200 feet, the area is covered with huge granite slabs and sandy soil from the erosion off of the rocks themselves. Mid-morning, we both heard a low, guttural growl, which sounded like someone saying, hey, several times. It was one of those sounds that makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Later, my dad told us that it wasn't. The first time he has heard anything odd like that. Evidently, when he had started hunting with my grandfather, his dad, they both heard this same type of vocalization on various occasions. Since this initial trip, I have hunted in that area for 19 years, and I have heard that same type of yell-slash-growl four other times, all in that area. I can honestly say this sound is like no other I have ever experienced. From mountain lion screams, elks bugling, deer and moose grunting, and bear snorts. On other hunts into the area, the sound was witnessed by two other hunting companions. It always seems to occur in the same drainage. Initially, I thought it might have been the wind echoing off the rocks, but I have been there in all different types of weather conditions and can testify that this is some type of creature-slash-animal-generated sound. Tonight's third encounter, Maricopa County, Arizona. This happened in Gila Bend, Arizona. My sister and her friend had gone horseback riding down at the river bottom, just north of the farm we had lived on. I decided to ride out and meet them, so I took one of our really gentle horses that has never gotten excited, jumped on him bareback. My parents' dogs were with me, two Roddies. When I got to the north end of the farm, I had to turn west and ride parallel with the Gila River. There was barbed wire fence between me and the river bottom. On the other side of the fence was overgrown with salt cedar trees. There was a cement ditch on the other side of the road, which led to a big sump full of farm runoff water. When we got close to the opening in the fence, the two dogs started sniffing the air and acted a little excited, and the horse was getting real antsy. I thought they could smell the other horses, and I was close to them. All of a sudden, the horse just stopped, and started to try rear up, and when I looked around, the dogs were gone. They had started running through the field back toward my parents' house. I heard something, and looked at the trees, and standing behind a tree, looking straight at me, was some sort of creature. It then stepped from behind the tree in full view. It was very tall because the fence didn't even reach the top of its legs. It was covered from head to toe in long brown hair. It had some kind of small snout and large pointed ears, almost like a jackrabbit. Its hair was matted and had salt cedar branches tangled in it. It just stood there looking at me with this curious look on its face. I held the horse as long as I could hold him, and just stared back, trying to comprehend what I was looking at. I was riding bareback, and I knew I couldn't stay on much longer if I didn't get away. I let the horse take off running to get to the road leading back to the house. We had to run about a quarter of a mile along the river, and this horse was in a full-out run, yet this thing seemed to be staying with us through the salt cedars. It was running bipedally along the fence just inside the trees with us. When I turned on the road toward the house, I looked back, and it was just standing there, now on all fours. I ran all the way home and told my dad and brother, who laughed at me and told me I was seeing things. They did, however, drive down to the river bottom looking for my sister and friend. 
They didn't see or find anything as far as I had seen. My sister and her friend said that when they were coming out of the river, their horses were acting funny, but they didn't see anything. A few years later, my dad and uncle had found a strange set of large tracks with what appeared to have claws in the mud near that same location. Tonight's fourth encounter, Maricopa County, Arizona. My best friend and I were big nighttime hiking fanatics. We decided to go to one of our usual locations just outside of the Phoenix area. We picked up two of our friends for company and away we went. We arrived at our destination somewhere between 9 and 10 p.m. We parked the truck near the main road but far enough into the recreational area where it couldn't be seen from the road so no one would think the truck was abandoned. Close to where we had parked and bordering the north side of this riparian area is a cap canal, and bordering the south three quarters of a mile is a major road. That night, we would be hiking through the northern half of it, and covered two to three miles to the east. We all walked down the canal road and left it after a while. We decided to hike some small trails with some pretty dense vegetation. On our way back, we returned on the canal road, following it back to the truck. As we're walking, my three friends became boisterous, reminiscing about old times and singing songs. The strange thing about this is I usually take part in this rowdiness. I instead was walking just behind them and not interacting with them at all. And we're about three quarters of the way back and I hear this tremendous guttural growl coming from our left or south from across this field of dry grass. This jolted my senses. I couldn't believe my ears. I immediately stopped in my tracks and knew the closest to this sound would have been an African lion. And yet, we are not in the Serengeti. We're in Maricopa County, Arizona. I jerked my head left and at the same time slowed the cadence of my steps. What I saw sent shivers down my spine. There were trees and heavy foliage at the opposite side of the field. In the middle of this grove stood the tallest and fullest of the trees. It was this tree that was being violently shaken, all the while hearing this lion-type growl. Now my senses are telling me this is something bigger than a bear, but as strong as a rhinoceros. I completely stopped walking, turned to face the direction of the tree, and reached down my leg to undo the safety catch of my bowie knife. I became fixated on this tree until it stopped shaking. I immediately crouched down on the hard-packed dirt road and began surveying the whole area. After what could have been a minute or two, Two short, dark, bipedal creatures ran from under the tree's low-hanging branches towards me. They were about three and a half to four feet, husky build, with long, hanging arms, and had dark, furry-looking outlines. They ran straight toward me, crossing the dry, grassy field, and crouched down about halfway across. They ran extremely fast and seemed to almost float across the grass with no apparent head bob. Incredibly. There was little to no noise coming from them tropping down this dry grass. Since I had regularly tracked rabbit and javelina at night, I was able to see and hear with extraordinary skill. At this point, I had tunnel sight and hearing. I blocked out my friend's noisy antics. I spent 30 seconds to one minute watching these creatures staring back at me. I'm getting very paranoid, so I slowly got up and made a number of steps to my right while keeping my head and eyes pointed toward them. I then felt comfortable enough to turn my whole body toward the direction of my friends and start walking. I had to keep my eyes on these creatures. They stood very still, so I started jogging away, looking over my shoulder frequently. At this point, I noticed how far ahead my friends were and totally oblivious to what had just happened. When I caught up to them, I stopped them and told them what had happened. They thought I was joking, which I was not. 
as I'm trying to convince them, I kept looking over my shoulder to see if there was any more activity. My friends finally took my pleas to heart, seeing that I was afraid, and asked what we should do. I told them that we need to start slowly jogging back to the truck and leave. We stopped occasionally to look back, but we didn't see anything. After this night, my friends always believed that this was a story cooked up by me to make the hike more interesting. I'd stayed away from hiking in that area for a few months, then decided to go back a couple of times, only never to return again. My feelings are the same as they were then. That to go back would certainly put me and anyone else in a high risk of danger. And tonight's final encounter. I was walking up the headwaters of a tributary of the Elk River. The Elk River is a wild stream. It boils, rolls, and digs deep the holes that incur the full wrath of the river. The streams that feed the elk are steep, fast, and cold most of the year, but in August everything heats up. Big trout escape the warming water by sneaking up any small streams not dried up and eat any fish or creature they can fit in their gullet. Seriously, I caught a brown just over 20 inches half a mile up the gully in a stream that you could stand on both sides. I digress. Me and a friend used to catch a ride with his older brother, a truck driver. He would drop us off at one of those tributaries in the morning and pick us back up on his last trip of the evening. Only thing he would tell us is watch out for rattlers and have your ass beside the road at five or you're walking. So, with a sack lunch and fishing poles, we would take off into the shadowy hollers. Me and my buddy are leapfrogging up this long rocky creek, catching brookies and every hole fishing toward lunchtime at the head of the stream. I got a little away from my buddy in a long, steep stretch of unfishable white water leading up to a set of falls. As I finally found a piece of land flat enough to rest above the falls, I looked around and saw something off about this laurel thicket. Limbs bent the wrong way, leaves turned up like it was broken. I walked closer and looked like something grayish-white hanging up in a tree. My buddy finally catches up to me, bragging over the roar of the water how he just caught and released over 47 on this stream and how there ain't no trout above those falls. And why do I always climb up and fish past them on dead water? And he saw me standing there surprised. He stops, catching his breath, and asked, why the hell I'm staring at the sun? I said, shut up and look at the tree. What is hanging from it? We walked closer and it looked oddly familiar. That's when I realized it was deer hair. Hell, that's a deer carcass hanging up in that tree. An old one. But a carcass just the same. We couldn't figure out how it had gotten up there. It was close to noon, and we were a long way from the hall road. Let's eat lunch and start making our way down. I popped a can of beanie weenies and dug out a bologna sandwich. My buddy pulled out two cans of pop and handed me one. We sat 30 yards away from our conversation piece and ate lunch. After we satisfied our growling bellies, we sat and rested for a couple minutes. My buddy stood up to go wander and take a leak. How you reckon that deer got up there, he said. Hell, I don't know, buddy. Maybe it climbed up there and died, or something dragged it up there. I stood straight up. My brother, you ever knew a bear to drag anything up a tree? Why would it? Nothing's running a bear off, a whole deer on the ground. Not coyotes, not hounds, and not another bear. When he turned around, I could see the fear all over him. We silently packed up lunch, broke our poles down, and commenced to getting out of there as quickly and quietly as we could. We made it back to the hall road an hour before his brother was coming out, and left an arrow pointing out of, made of sticks, so he knew that we had started walking, and to catch us on his way. And then it started to rain. We were halfway back to an old sawmill, 
when I heard the old triaxle rumbling on the hall road. We took shelter under an overgrown iron tree beside the road, not like it mattered, and waited for him to catch up to us. We climbed up in the truck, stashed our gear, and told him what we saw as he drove us out of there. We stopped at the mill to unload, and my buddy's brother told us to come on. We have to talk to somebody. We told our story to an older gentleman who worked at the mill, and he drove us back up the hall road and marked the hollow with pink ribbon. Years later, I found out that that old man was a farmer, and he had been losing sheep for years and finding them hanging in treetops. Young calves, too. We stumbled into a howl. That something called home. To this day, I don't know why he marked it, and I really don't want to know. But we never fished anything that ran into the elk until I got old enough to handle myself, never unarmed and never alone. All right, guys, I hope you all enjoyed this absolutely horrific experience. I know I did a lot of just really interesting and terrifying experiences to share. Thank you for supporting the channel. After all, it is your support that continues for this channel to grow and go. And also what makes it a place for people to share without ridicule and judgment. Just treated with the simple respect that we all deserve and that is appreciated. With that being said, everyone stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant. Keeping an eye on our children, pets, family, and friends. These creatures are real, they are out there, and they are definitely dangerous. Share this information with the people you love and care about, and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions, never stop searching for answers, and God bless.